What's up again, guys? I just wanted to talk to you about our other sponsor for today. Bring Back Bronco, The Untold Story, a new podcast about the rise, fall, and rebirth of the Ford Bronco. Bring Back Bronco is the story of a truck and the story of a country, okay? The rise, fall, and rebirth of the Ford Bronco is sort of like a metaphor for the last 50 years in America. It's a really good podcast. I listened to two episodes. Uh, if you guys like Past Gas, you're definitely going to like Bring Back Bronco. So season one is going to dig into the questions that tell us as much about America as it does about this iconic vehicle. There's the OJ Simpson chase that happened more than 25 years ago. And yet there are still a lot of questions about its impact on the Bronco. For the first time ever, uh, Bring Back Bronco takes you inside Ford that day to discover what was happening during that chase inside a Ford factory, inside a Ford call center, inside the chairman's office for that chase. So search for Bring Back Bronco, the untold story anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, we'll include a link for it in the description and the show notes. My many thanks to Bring Back Bronco for sponsoring this episode. And how do you like how do you feel about your relationship with him now? Because, I mean, it seemed like he was taking advantage of you and a lot of people's like goodwill towards this like exciting car culture. But uh, yeah, so in 2002, I was pretty pissed off at him. Mm hmm. You know, and then they got closed, I think it's 2005 or 2006 or so. I met up with Hero. Mm hmm. They're stuck. You've got all these people that are complaining. You've got all this shit that's sideways. What can we do to fix this? What do we need to do to get these cars released to these customers? To get the any to get day off your back? And if that's the end of it, that's the end of it. But, you know, what can we do to fix it? On a fateful day in 2005, Sean Morris walked into a Starbucks on Flower Street in Los Angeles. He was meeting with his old boss, Hiroki Nanahoshi. Hiro ran a company called Motorex, where Sean used to work, that was now in deep trouble. The company was supposed to be importing Nissan Skyline GTRs from Japan, but orders were late and dozens of annoyed customers were hounding Hiro about their missing cars. You know, Hiro started to look other methods to do things. You know, again, he was, he was getting pretty desperate. You know, on, on how to, you know, cars were getting approved. And yeah. Things, things, things. Sean had walked away from Motorex a few years back, no longer willing to deal with Hero, who seemed more interested in partying at Japanese hostess bars and flashing cash than taking care of his business. Sean, on the other hand, was in it for the cars, those beautiful skylines that just wanted to go home to their rightful owners. Hero agreed to let Sean help him with the back ordered cars, but it never happened. A few weeks later, Hero was arrested and put on $1 million bail, charged with attempted extortion. Rumors were flying around that he had doctored papers and sold the same car to multiple people in a crazy sort of Ponzi scheme. Today on Pass Gas, it's the rise and fall of Motorex and how Hiroki Nanahoshi, who was once seen as the savior of the Nissan Skyline in the United States, turned into the villain. A million dollars bail? <clears throat> That's insane, dude. Insane. That is insane, dude. Joe, what's the highest bail you've ever been held on? <laughs> uh, probably 500 bucks. 20 grand, baby. 20 grand? Yep. Whoa, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And So I'm assuming that you stayed in jail that night? I was in jail for three days, four days. Oh my god, <clears throat> James, do you mind if I ask why? Uh, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> do you? <laughs> mm -hmm. They <laughs> they, char they charge you with a class A felony. Oh Jesus! Yeah. Did it get dropped? Yeah, that's like the plan. Like everybody in my cell was arrested for a misdemeanor and charged with a felony, so they could keep you in jail till Friday instead of Wednesday. And, uh, yeah, cause they get paid a certain amount of money for everyone in a cell every night. Oh my God. Yeah, man. That's well, the prison for profit system, bro. Yeah. 
Certainly sounds like a system that's working well. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Past Gas <laughs> Podcast. I am your host, Nolan Sykes, joined, as always, by my two co-hosts who have done time. It's uh, James Pumphrey. <laughs> More power, baby! And Joe Weber. Hey, man, keep your keep my name out of your mouth. How about that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm very glad to be joined by you guys. Uh for this episode, this is going to be a wild one. We've wanted to do this for a while, and um, I'm I'm stoked that we're finally telling this wild crime story. I've heard, ah. like, I'm excited, man. I've heard this is like one of those, like, you know, you've heard little things. There's like a big magazine article about it, a, 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 like years ago. But right, like, right when I realized there were cars that we couldn't get here, and I wanted them, uh, I heard about. Motor X, and then all this stuff happened, and uh, <laughs> it's really hard to get like actual information about it. Um, there's, like I said, one really long magazine article. It's either in Super Street or Sport Compact Car. I don't remember. Um, but we actually talked to the dude. We talked to one of the dudes involved, and uh, we're gonna set the record straight. He went on record. And this is like, this is first party information, you guys. This does not exist anywhere else. Uh, so I'm really, really excited to tell this story, find out what actually happened. Um, this is this is not just a podcast anymore, you guys. This is news. Uh, we have an 180 gram vinyl, colored vinyl of his him setting the record straight. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know anything about this. Um, I don't know where I was. I must have tuned out for all this. Because I knew I could never afford <laughs> a Skyline at the time or now. So I'm going to be basically a vehicle for exposition for you guys to explain stuff to me and a representation of our audience who doesn't know what's going on. That sounds like a, a format that's never been done in podcasting before. <laughs> and uh, for that, I'm very proud. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very stoked. Okay. Uh, are you guys ready? I'm ready. Can right, I be part cool. of the Fired Up Nation? Hell yeah. Fired Up! <laughs> uh, every time you say it, I'll send you a sticker. Oh, nice. Thanks, man. Send them in separate envelopes with separate postage, <laughs> please. Yeah, because the postal service isn't under enough stress right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's five from the same guy to the same guy. <laughs> it actually costs Joe money each time someone else says it. It's the only case of like a <laughs> copyright that isn't profitable. Um, uh, so that's very interesting. The horrible IP. <laughs> <laughs> All right. In the late 90s in Southern California, Motorex was founded. Its mission was to make dreams come true, or at least one very specific Japanese domestic market related dream. Getting the Nissan Skyline GTR 32, 33, and 34 from Japan to customers in the United States legally. If that sounds simple, it's not. As we'll see, the current process for importing cars like the Skyline couldn't be more complicated. For that reason, although the Skyline had a devoted cult following in the US through car magazines, early internet forums, and PlayStation's Gran Turismo series, the car couldn't be legally imported to the United States. Why not? How did we get to that point? And who were the major players at Motorex, the company that would finally bring the skylines across the Pacific Ocean and to the States? And how did it all go so terribly wrong? There's a lot to explain, and a lot of that remains a mystery even today. To fill in the blanks, as James mentioned, we talked to Sean Morris, the owner of Top Rank Vehicle Importers, uh, down in Orange County. They're Top awesome. Rank. They're great guys. Yeah. They got they bring over really cool cars. They make the whole process really easy, super legal. Uh they, I think I believe they also have financing available. That's right. Um, uh yeah, want... we've worked with Top Rank uh many times uh in the past for various videos, mostly bumper to bumper episodes. Uh we shot we shot a episode of Wheelhouse with them as well. The first episode um, of Miracle Whips. That's right. Yeah. So we've, 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 we've done a lot of stuff with them. Always a joy going down to their warehouse and seeing what they've got. Yeah, if you want a cool Japanese car, uh, just don't, don't go anywhere else. Top Rank now does what Motor X is doing 20 years ago. 
importing cars from Japan to make them legal to own and drive in the United States. Sean was at Motorex in the early days of the company and played a key role in getting it up and running. But his days in the car business started a decade before Motorex existed. So let's go back to the late 80s and talk about how the beginnings of Motorex actually started with a totally different kind of car importing. We're talking, of course, about the sale of the legendary American icon known as the Chevrolet Astrovan. What? Okay, okay. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were gonna say Mustang or Camaro or Impala. The Chevy Mustang? You thought I was going to say the Chevy Mustang? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the Chevy Mustang. <laughs> uh, the well, this is, this is cool for me because I... Uh, my family had a Astro conversion van growing up when I was growing up and we took multiple, like 5,000 mile road trips in it, like year after year for like four or five years. And but we, you, we you were like, you were not sweating it because you're sitting in that captain's chair, buddy. No, captain's chair could swivel all the way around. I had curtains. I had my airplane lights on the side. I had more cup holders than any 11 year old ever would need. <laughs> Do you have a TV? Uh, we never got the TV, but there was a little Ooh. port. I know, right? There were there were ports uh, in at least in the middle seats for N64 controllers. <gasps> yeah, just yeah, like damn, cool. awesome. teasing you. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, we did road trips as well, like up to Sacramento area and going camping and stuff, but. We had just a minivan most of the time, so it was be jam packed with camping stuff. And then I have I have two uh, two sisters, so we'd just be crammed in there as well. I have a feeling the minivan is probably not as comfortable as the Chevy Astro definitely conversion not. van. We didn't do anything when I was a kid. We didn't. <laughs> I was not engaged with. <laughs> i'm sorry that's kind of sad i would i would leave my house right after i ate breakfast and come back after dark <laughs> i don't know I, how to respond to that in like a fun way <laughs> i had a great really i mean sad. i had a great time i had a great i, I had woods i had some yeah. good friends in the hood and i had a bike i just rode around the woods played in the creek uh <laughs> pulled crawfish out did you eat them? No, they were gross. But uh, built forts, uh, destroyed construction sites. <laughs> oh my Hell God. yeah! I got arrested destroying a construction site one time because we stole all the like insulation that was about to go in the the walls, mm -hmm. and we made a giant uh, like paper airplane out Whoa. of it that was like eight feet wide. <laughs> what? I used, to, I used to go and destroy construction sites, like not even like. Thinking I was doing anything, like just being like, it's fucking here. Yeah. <laughs> like, <I'm pushing laughs> yeah. <laughs> like not thinking like, oh, this is going to cost someone money. I would just go in and be like, oh, look, I can punch through this foam. Yeah. I sincerely apologize to anyone who I wronged as a teenager. I was an asshole <laughs> and I hope I don't raise an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was like, I was like, I was like, not a teenager at this point. I was like five and six. Oh, I thought you were gonna say like, I was like twenty three. Uh, no, no, I was a little. I was a little little kid. Wait, what kind of strong ass buff ass Kyle, five year old, goes around punching through drywall? No, not drywall. There's like the like not the pink insulation stuff, but there's like yeah, different. it's like fiberglassy kind of. Uh -huh. Or no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why am I so well, itching? Of Chevy Astro vans, <laughs> a a. An Astro conversion van just drove by my place, so I think that's that's a sign. That's that a good sign. Yeah, we should move on. <laughs> Before the Nissan Skyline was ever a Japanese cult phenomenon in the United States, the Chevy Astro was an American cult phenomenon in Japan. The box-shaped maxi van, which was released in 1985 and marketed as the vehicle to make you realize that life was too big for a minivan... Auto traders speculated that the reason for the van's popularity wasn't that it fit into Japanese culture, but that it stood out. It was popular specifically because the oversized gas guzzler seemed as American to Japanese consumers as Big Mac or Michael Jordan. So while American car enthusiasts wanted cars from the JDM or Japanese domestic market to give them a taste of Japanese culture, 
The Japanese wanted a car that made them feel like they were living in a suburb just outside of Cleveland. Hence, ah, uh, that's where you want to be. The Astro. <laughs> yeah, man. Is that where Job is from? Uh, he's from oh, a- Dayton. 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 Okay. Mm hmm. Just like I'm actually- Nolan is doing with a girl, apparently, and he brings it up in <laughs> God, every, he won't stop talking about every it. Every podcast, <laughs> Nolan's like, oh, my girlfriend is texting me. She wants to talk to me, probably about <laughs> eating together and kissing. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, dude, chill. Nolan, uh, Joe and I both live with girls, <laughs> all right? We guess. That's true. <laughs> You guys do. I live by myself, as I also like to bring up all the time. Uh, speaking of, of, of Cleveland and Dayton, uh, I was actually planning this year around this time, had things not gone sideways, of like doing like a, a Midwest tour, just like going to different going to different Midwest cities that are often overlooked. Yeah. I was talking to you, James, about possibly going to Louisville. Yeah. I would Where? love to do that. What are you saying? Where did you say? What? What did you say? I said you and I were talking about going to Louisville. Oh, uh, Louisville. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand you because you said it wrong. <laughs> you said it Louisville like a month ago, and now you're correcting me on the pronunciation. It's, now you're saying it Louisville. No, what is wrong? Lou, what is happening? Louisville. 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 Yeah, that's what I said. No, you, you said lo- right. you said you know what? I know what Louisville is. Okay, <laughs> it's not Louisville. It it's Louisville. It's not Louisville, dude. <laughs> I I quit this pot. <laughs> Louisville, what is this? I, I don't know, man. I'm glad he quit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, James and I were talking about going to the popular metropolitan area in <laughs> Kentucky, which has the same name as a baseball bat. Uh, mm-hmm. I wanted to go to multiple Midwest cities like that because I think they're overlooked. And underappreciated. And I wanted to I wanted to sample various foods. Now there's a siren going by my place once again. I'm fired up. <laughs> we could anyway. have gone to the Louisville Slugger factory and they give you a little bat. Hell yeah. I want to go. I'm all about that. So back to the Astro. <laughs> this is the business that Sean Morris's family was into while he was a kid. They had a successful auto exporting business based in Southern California. And their best seller was the Chevy Astro. This was the 80s, and the Japanese economy was booming, baby. The country was actually richer per capita than the United States, and Japanese consumers had tons of disposable income to buy what they wanted, and one of the things that they wanted was American cars. Beyond Chevy Astros, American was what sold. Corvettes and Mustangs were popular and sold at a premium. Certain European models were popular too, like the Volvo 850 station wagon, nicknamed the Turbo Wagon. Apparently, the rule for exporting to Japan was the boxier, the better. On the flip side, foreign cars were also coming into the United States through independent dealers in a business that was called gray market importing. The business of gray import vehicles, also called parallel importing. Basic, sometimes I'll go on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist and just type in gray market and see what comes up. Oh, that's cool. Basically, it includes any car that is not sold directly by the company that manufactured the car. The term gray market comes from the fact that selling these cars wasn't illegal like a black market. The sales take place in a gray area where importers are taking advantage of whatever loopholes they can to get their consumers the car they want. In the world of automotive sales, big auto companies were often opposed to the gray market because although it could help popularize their cars, gray market sales directly competed with their U.S.-based auto dealerships. For auto consumers in the U.S., on the other hand, the gray market could be a great deal, offering cheaper prices as well as access to specific models that, for whatever reason, car companies weren't exporting. It wasn't all good, though. There were some real risks involved with putting your faith in an independent importer. You're putting your trust in the importer to actually come through and get your car. Motorax itself, unfortunately, became the perfect example of the risks involved when you rely on an independent importer. But to understand Motorax, you first have to understand the gray market and how it works in the United States. In the U.S., the gray import market started during World War II and its immediate aftermath when American soldiers stationed in Europe started buying European cars while they were overseas especially British sports cars. When their tours of duty were complete, they didn't want to part with their cars, so they had them shipped home. 
This helped popularize foreign cars and also led to US automakers building models to compete with the sports cars being brought over. For instance, in 1951, Chevy introduced the Corvette. The name Corvette comes from the word for a specific kind of small, nimble Navy ship that was used in World War II. Perhaps a nod to how these cars became popular and who was buying them. Even with American-made versions of their cars entering the market, independent importers, many of whom were actually the World War II vets who had first brought back cars, continued to thrive. That all changed in the 60s, though, when a dude named Ralph Nader wrote Unsafe at Any Speed, which was surprisingly not a book about James. <laughs> it was an expose on how dangerous cars were. Admittedly, cars at that time were kind of death traps, right up there with guns and cigarettes. Even requirements as basic as seatbelts weren't required to be installed. The public responded, and Nader's book went gangbusters, which is 1960s slang for viral. <laughs> also, I want to—I just want to apologize to James for a little bit. He, he has become a much better driver within the last year. I have. Um, well, have, I want to apologize have. to Nolan because Ralph Nader is boring but sexy, just like Nolan. <laughs> That's true. Thank you. Thank you. The American government responded with several waves of regulation, and in 1970, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, was established. The motto of the NHTSA was people saving people, and safety changes made to cars did save people. But the agency also created a lot of red tape. And if you think about it, the NHTSA is just the TSA with even more letters. <laughs> Which I'm not sure if I completely agree with, but uh, <laughs> all these complications ironically helped make the gray market more popular than ever. Foreign automakers often decided it wasn't worth it to try to bring their car models into compliance to be sold in the American market. The rules often seemed unfair or arbitrary, like in 1974, when that year's Citroen SM, which was considered one of the best built, most technologically advanced cars of the time, was banned from the US markets for its variable height suspension, a feature that didn't make the car more dangerous in any provable way. In fact, variable suspension was decades ahead of its time and is now offered on cars like the Tesla Model S. Customers wanted what they couldn't get, so the gray market thrived. That's such a dumb thing. Like, why, why do that? Well, we're gonna find out. All of which, Gets us back to the 80s and the backlash to the backlash that would decimate the gray market industry. Like we said, in Japan, the economy was booming and U.S. exporters were doing great business. On the flip side, the American economy went through a recession in the 80s and companies were putting pressure on the government to protect their interests. Now, you might think that pressure would come from American companies in the form of tariffs and other taxes, and that was certainly true. But the leader of the charge against the gray market was actually Mercedes-Benz of North America. Their dealerships were suffering. Cars like the Mercedes G-Class SUV or the G-Wagon as it's commonly known were being shipped in by importers who would undercut the dealership prices. All of this led to the passage in Congress of the Imported Vehicle Safety Compliance Act of 1988, or as it probably should have been known, the Americans don't get cool cars law of the year Die Hard came out. <laughs> <laughs> did you know it's a Christmas movie? Did you know it's actually a Christmas movie? I will admit I did I did hop on that train for a little bit and uh I blame Reddit for that. Hey guys, Although, may the fourth be with you. Oh dude, that's so funny. <laughs> it, it's gonna be May. <laughs> that one is funny. A smaller percentage of our audience will get this one, but brand new, the band, uh, they have a song where it's like, uh, and you don't care about brand new or May. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Although Die Hard sued the pain, the Compliance Act had an instant chilling effect on independently imported vehicles. In fact, it was more of an ice age than a chill. In a single decade, the gray market went from selling 66,900 vehicles in 1985. Nice. That's a that's a hidden nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. To a grand total to a grand total of 300 in all of 1995. That's 300 cars across all makes and models. 
the whole industry had pretty much been wiped out. That's like one of the most depressing laws passed in my lifetime that affected me the most probably in and hindsight. It can, oh, it absolutely. Happened in your birth year too, maybe on your birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Thanks, Mercedes slash Congress. <laughs> 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 yeah, that it that I mean it's just like uh, Well the two yeah, bullets canceled each other out. He's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it should be repealed, frankly. I'd go so far as to say quite frankly, Nolan. <laughs> quite frankly. To get a car certified to import, you now had to make a petition to the NHTSA that involved intensive documentation and testing. This process was so intensive that in two thousand after 12 years of the Compliance Act being in effect, only 16 models had been approved. And in the words of Sean Morris, some of those were horse trailers. So in the 10 years of time between then and 1999, when actually 2000 was when Motorex got their uh, petition approved, mm -hmm. that's only, there was only 17 total vehicles approved in 10 years. Wow. And some of those are like horse trailer. You know, like a horse trailer was not originally sold in the U.S., and that's that's it. So, you know, of those actual cars, I mean, the only one that's really in there that's that's kind of, I guess, worth the shit is the uh, the G wagon, the Galanda wagon, done by Europa. Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, the company that would submit the seventeenth ever petition, a so-called startup named Motorex, the car they would submit for approval, the Nissan Skyline GTR. Sean Morris had visited Japan in 1991 as a 16-year-old and saw the Nissan Skyline in person for the first time. Uh, he was impressed. He remembers <laughs> thinking it'd be great to have a Skyline back in the United States, but back then it just felt impossible. You know, especially especially then in 91, you know, finding that information out, figuring those things out is impossible. Right. You know, back then there's no internet. You know, the only things you can do is call people on the phone and, mm -hmm. you know, request papers over, you know. So, you know, finding any of that information out was, was basically, you know, you have to go on hearsay from somebody else. And, you know, people just say it was impossible, you know, or it can be done. As unattainable as it was in the States, in Japan, the car was equal to the Mustang or Corvette in terms of its place in the country's car history. Do you guys remember in Avatar when... I just watched Avatar. So, yes. It doesn't hold up. <laughs> Not good. Just the first time I hear them say, we're here for the unobtainium. Yeah, it's I just like, or BC. Oh, my eyes rolled yeah, back in goes, my head. He goes, you know why we're here? For this. It's called unobtainium, and it's worth a billion dollars an ounce. <laughs> like, what do you do with it? I, 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 can't, I still can't believe that they actually named it that. Uh, although I will say I probably still like Avatar as much the same amount as I did the first time I saw it. Uh, I, I'm not a hater. I think it's a. I okay. A I want you to film. watch it again. I did a, next, a week ago. <laughs> oh, why are you guys all watching Avatar? <laughs> I I saw Avatar in the theater. It, the 3D was mind blowing. Yeah, it was um, insane. Yeah, it was. In, I loved how they used it to show depth instead of stuff coming out at you. I was really impressed yeah, yeah. by that. Mm -hmm. And I got into a fight with my ex girlfriend because. Uh, I was upset because not upset, but like I was like, I can't believe the Hurt Locker won the Oscar. I think uh, <laughs> Avatar should because it progressed filmmaking more, and she disagreed with me. Oh, wow. well, that's why she's your ex girlfriend now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my current lady friend loves Avatar and everything <laughs> from Mr. Cameron's catalog. Yes, <laughs> including The Abyss. Casey actually doesn't watch a lot of movies, but every once in a while she'll pull out like a real deep, weird, like cut. Like the other day she was like, I was like, Casey, you want some sauce? Do you want, I was making breakfast. I was like, do you want sausage? And go, she goes like, daddy, do you want some sausage? <laughs> I'm like, you've never seen the Terminator, but you've seen Freddy got fingered. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Do you guys, speaking of deep, deep cuts, do you guys think I should watch uh, Synecdoche, Schenectady, New York by Charlie Ooh. Kaufman tonight? Should I watch yeah. that? I love Charlie yeah. Kaufman. Love. He's got, he's got, that, that he's new got a new movie, movie coming out. Yeah, but, he's got yeah. a new one coming out, so I want to catch up because it looks Isn't pretty sick. An American treasure. Anyway, James, please continue. <laughs> 
Real quick, guys, I want to tell you about our sponsor for today, Surfshark VPN. You've probably heard of Surfshark VPN. What do they do? Well, they protect your info from being uh, spied on. So much of what we do nowadays is through the internet, whether it's working from home or, you know, chilling out and watching your favorite shows with streaming services, listening to music, or just browsing the internet. What a lot of people don't know is that all that information, though, is um, visible to your internet service provider. And that's why I use Surfshark VPN. Surfshark VPN is a service that protects your information by encrypting the data that you send through the internet, which keeps people from looking at it. Right now, Surfshark has a great deal for past gas listeners. Enter code PASTGAS, that's P-A-S-T-G-A-S, and you'll get 85% off plus three extra months free. Holy crap. <laughs> 85% off plus three extra months for free. That's amazing. Surfshark also offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you try it and you don't like it, you can simply cancel your subscription and get your money back. That's really awesome. So remember, that's past gas, P-A-S-T-G-A-S, and get 85% off and three months for free. So thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring past gas. Now back to the episode. First Skyline was actually sold in 1957 and produced not by Nissan, but by the Prince Motor Company. Prince eventually merged with Nissan, and the first Nissan Skyline came out in 1968. This was followed soon after by the first GTR, a front-engine, rear-wheel drive beast that was built for racing with bucket seats, three-spoke steering wheel, and an aluminum-finished pedal. 1,945 of these first-gen Skylines were made. The car had immediate success in racing and fit into what Road & Track called Nissan's win-on-Sunday, sell-on-Monday strategy. Unfortunately, the follow-up second-gen released in the 70s came at a time when a gas shortage made racing-oriented cars less popular. And so, only 197 second-gen GTRs were built. Meanwhile, the mainline Nissan Skyline continued to be sold. Amazingly, Shinichiro Sakurai was the lead designer of the car from the 60s all the way to the 80s, which is evident in the continuity of the car's design. In 1989, the GTR relaunched with the R32. Unlike previous Skylines, the R32 had an all-wheel drive option. Like the first-gen GTR, the 89 GTR immediately dominated Japanese racing winning 29 races in a row in the Japanese Touring Car Championship. They're like Mercedes in F1. The car was a certified JDM banger. A Nismo model was released in 1990, which included twin steel turbine turbos and an upgraded body kit. Next came the R33 in 1993, the R34 in 1998. These models built on the success of the R32 and introduced new technology and electronic components. The R33 is slightly longer and wider with lower suspension, while the R34 featured a sleeker front and a more efficient engine. The options on the 390s era GTRs are dizzyingly complex and could fill up an entire episode. The massive which we've done, which we've, we've done, done oh, that. We've, we've done, done a series. Two, two, oh yeah, we did this show. We've done the GTR a lot of times. Uh, we did two episodes of Up to Speed on it. We did. Two episodes of uh, Past Gas as well. Yeah. The massive variety of the car is part of what won the Skyline a cult following. You could easily talk for hours about the options on a single year's model. Unfortunately, talk was all Skyline fans in the United States were getting. Sean Morris was among them. After seeing the Skyline firsthand on his trip to Japan, he returned to the U.S. and joined the Navy. But the Skyline was always on his mind. He dreamed of bringing one to the U.S., and he finally got the opportunity when Hiro Nanahoshi, the man that Sean would encourage to come clean years later in that L.A. Starbucks, recruited Sean for his new company, MotorX. Hiroki, or Hiro as everyone called him, grew up in Osaka, Japan. His dad worked for Sapporo Beer, and he had a typical middle-class upbringing. In high school... Hiro spent two years as a foreign exchange student in the United States, learning English and finding he liked life in America. A few years later, he would return to the U.S. and move to the Los Angeles area, taking odd jobs at restaurants and just bouncing around. He seemingly had no links to the auto industry, nor was that his reason for moving to the U.S. Eventually, Hiro met Wataru Noto, who had previously worked at Advanced Auto Group 
a Japanese dealership company that Sean's family had worked with in the past. As Japan continued to suffer through its, quote, lost decade, it was clear that business might be better if it focused on moving cars in the reverse direction, from the depressed economy of Japan to the booming United States of the late 90s. So, you know, we were dealing with one place over in Japan that was called Advance International. They, they sent some of their employees here to the States to kind of learn some stuff about the business and stuff from, from us. Mm -hmm. One of those employees, and then another guy who was an exporter, uh, Hiro Nanahoshi, mm -hmm. uh, we got together and, uh, you know, they started to talk about, uh, you know, potentially bringing in cars into the U.S. And of course, you know, the first cars you talk about then was the, uh, the Skyline GTR. So, um, they ended up getting money from Advance International to start actually, you know, bringing the cars over in earnest. Now, there's been a few companies that had talked about doing it and, and kind of started up and never really pushed through the, the bullshit. Because the thing is that, you know, it's easy enough to say you're going to do something, but when it comes down to brass tacks of actually putting the money up that was required in order to do crash testing and certification, all the rest of the stuff, right. it was not something that most people were going to do. Yeah, that seems really complicated. In Southern California, the world of people working in the Japanese auto industry was small. Noto introduced Hiro to Mr. Sawami, the mysterious owner of the Advanced Auto Group, a man who, according to an article in Zero to 60 magazine on the history of Motor X, had a, quote, small, slender frame and was, quote, <laughs> almost always clad in a clean white suit which yeah. hid a back covering tattoo. This Ooh. guy sounds bad. <laughs> yeah. This guy's like the opposite of Nolan. Sexy, but dangerous. Whoa, hey, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I'm not dangerous. Even though Mr. Sawami was a total enigma, maybe because of his mystique, Hiro latched onto the man as the man he wanted to become. <clears throat> sounds like a pretty cool dude to be. Eventually, Hiro succeeded in forging a connection. He convinced Mr. Sawami to give him a million dollar loan to form the company that would become Motor X. Mr. Sawami's loan came with the condition that Watari Noto would be a silent partner, presumably as his eyes and ears in the firm. But why would a wealthy businessman like Mr. Sawami invest in an unproven 26 year old kid from Osaka with almost no experience in the car industry? According to Ken Takahashi, who at the time was an owner of an export company called Ground Zero, part of what made the pitch so appealing was that the Japanese stock market was tanking, making dropping money into an overseas business a more appealing option. Whatever the reason, Mr. Soami signed on, and Takahashi was also hired him, making him, Hiro, and Noto the partners of a brand new company that at the date of its creation had no legal way of doing business. I would not... Take a million. I would not ask that guy to. I would not borrow a million dollars from that guy. No, not at all. I think white suits are scary. Uh, if you are, if your trademark is a white suit, yep, one hundred percent. I, I, I'll be. Uh, I'll associate with you maybe, but I'm. Yeah, I'm with you, James. I'm not going to borrow a million dollars. I'll you borrow know, like twenty bucks. Yeah, I'll go get beer. I'll go get beer for twenty bucks. I'll go do it. You know how many people. Colonel Sanders has inadvertently murdered with his chicken. <laughs> Not I was, inadvertently. I was, I was almost one of them. I was almost yeah. one of them. Colonel Sanders almost killed me. I'm from Kentucky. I love that chicken. <laughs> I also love that chicken from Popeyes. But I don't want to get into it. I miss it love so much. that chicken from Popeyes. At first, Motor X was based on Western Avenue in Torrance, California at a really small shop. There were three or four employees and only enough space for a small handful of cars. Hero partnered with JK Technologies, a U.S. standards conversion company based in Baltimore, to help with the intensive process of getting the GTR approved for legal import and sale in the United States. That's around the same time when Sean Morris came in to help the Japanese owners navigate the U.S. regulations. Now, before anything else could happen, MotorX had to file to become a registered importer to bring the Skylines over to the states. Then, a petition for the GTR R32 and R33 had to be written and submitted to the NT NHTSA. If the petition was approved, it would still be MotorX's responsibility to bring their cars into compliance with environmental and safety regulations. Plus, if they wanted to sell cars in California, 
They also had to deal with California Air Resources Board, a separate state-level agency that regulates emission standards for the state. If all that sounds like visiting the DMV while simultaneously doing your taxes and taking the SAT, you wouldn't be far off. It was clear why nobody else was doing this. To get to the point where the company would be cleared to sell a single car, there would they would already be a million dollars in the hole, not to mention the man hours required to work through all the paperwork. Plus, there was no guarantee anything would work out. If the NHTSA wanted to, they could deny the petition for whatever reason they wanted. So, I mean, it, it seems like they were pretty dedicated to spending the money to do this process correctly and, and like, right. set up this pipeline. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so, you know, because it was it was going to be a business. I mean, the only right. way you can do this stuff is, is to do it as a business. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously, you know, but, you know, yeah, as you can kind of hear, there's, you know, pretty intense costs. And that's, and that's cost, that's research and development costs even before you get into the, to the individual costs. So right. and we're only talking, we're only talking at NHTSA. We're right. talking one single government agency out of five, seven, 12, 27 agencies are going to satisfy. So, so um, at that point, were you like wondering where all that money was coming from or? I was coming from events. I knew, I knew where it was coming from. Mm-hmm. It was coming from Benton National, who again was our, was, was our, my family's customer for quite a while there mm-hmm. was a bank conversion and they're their car dealer in japan got it so so the money was was you know a, a, a loan i guess you could say you know to, to 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 start up and fund motorized here in the states still the process wasn't without its fun moments the buzz around the skyline was incredibly strong and motorex brought over a demo car from japan and started taking it to shows and races around the country to build excitement around the mission Another one of the highlights, which also happened to be the most expensive aspect of the approval process, came in the form of crash testing. Crash testing was the most prohibitive requirement the NHTSA had for registering an import, and the reason was cost. The requirements was for four different crash tests, front, rear, and both sides of the car. To do the tests, MotorX hired MGA Research based in Burlington, Wisconsin. Each individual test was $25,000, not to mention the cost of the car that they were wrecking. Luckily, the same car could be rigged up for multiple tests, but it wasn't going to be in great shape after they were done. Sean remembers (laughs) being amazed at the violence of even a low-impact crash. They were standing a good distance away, but still got splayed with glass. While the MotorX guys were getting the car tested, they stayed at a customer's house in Chicago. At this time, there was only goodwill and excitement for what MotorX and what they were trying to accomplish. It would have been so much easier if they would have just RB swapped a Chevy Astro van. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's essentially the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think our audience probably knows this, but a lot of people don't realize is that like supercar manufacturers also have to do crash testing. So oh, they have yeah. to build these extremely expensive there's that, and there's that video of uh, there's that video of the um, Koenigsegg getting crash yeah. tested, and it's just like it's awesome. It has like a billion views. It's so weird to watch. Sean thinks it's ironic that Motorex gets such a bad rap for illegal activity today because the company started out trying to do things the right way. There were certainly shady illegal methods of getting the car you wanted from Japan into the U.S. You could have broken it down into parts, which were legal for import, then reassemble the car in the States. You could also try having the car shipped to Canada or Mexico, which had different import laws, and then driving it across the border. You could also just mislabel the freight that was being shipped over, label a Skyline as a Civic, and hope the customs officer doesn't watch Donut. Of course, all these methods were highly illegal, and there was a chance to get into a lot of trouble, not to mention having the car seized by the NHTSA, and crushed into an extremely expensive paperweight. All of that bad stuff was that Motorex, with the best of intentions, wanted to avoid by doing things the right way. But the flip side of those good intentions was colliding with the economic reality of what they were trying to accomplish. The costs started as soon as you wanted to bring the car to the US. This required the importer to sign a bond for 150% of the value of the vehicle. If the importer didn't then bring the car into compliance with U.S. regulations, they wouldn't get the bond back. So it's like a security deposit almost. Yeah. Once they had certified the car, the NHTSA reserved the right to come and inspect the process at any point. If the government was satisfied, they'd sign the bond release, 
which wasn't actually the government saying they had inspected the car. It was just a piece of paper saying that, quote, it appears the registered importer did what they said they did. The importer was on the hook if that turned out not to be true. Meanwhile, the car also had to be modified for the US market. This meant new parts like speedometers and improved safety features, as well as passing environmental regulations. The NHTSA could, and often did, ask for whatever they wanted. After the crash testing, for instance, they decided that they wanted MotorX to do an additional, quote, non-belted front test. MotorX pushed back. They didn't have a car to spare to rig up for the testing, and in that case, they got lucky. The NHTSA accepted their petition, and the GTR became the 17th certified car for import to the United States. Sean still remembers the day MotorX got their first car certified, November 15th, 1999. It was a silver R32. Like, I, I still know the owner, the guy who has it. I still remember the chassis number because I remember some of those things. That's and, awesome. Uh, um, and anyway, that was, that was the first car. And so the thing is that the petition wasn't actually published in the Federal Register until 2000. Uh -huh. so we got our first bond release on the petition that wasn't yet published. Uh huh. It's, it's weird to get something released before the petition was published. Right. If it's me, I wouldn't give somebody a bond release until after the petition was published. Right. The petition isn't active. Basically, the law's not active and you're allowing somebody to, to say this is good under the law. It's so, confusing. It, it is, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's weird, but that's, but again, those are kind of things that I throw out to people, and, and the same, you'll say, well, that doesn't make any sense, and I'm going to say, but that's the way it was. Right. The guys at MotorX had done a lot of modifications to the car, and they were joking that with all the work that they put into it, it was now a mean and nasty car. <laughs> at the time, McDonald's had a burger called the McTasty, so uh, Takahashi or Taka put it all together, the silver R32 was now called McTasty. <laughs> McNasty. <laughs> McNasty. <laughs> Lunch time. <laughs> yeah, I am hungry. I'm very hungry. I could eat a I could eat a I could eat a whole car right now. Even before the McNasty sold, Motorex had dozens of orders with a constant stream of customers coming in to check out the cars and put their name on the wait list. However, even as the business was succeeding in its mission, Sean was starting to realize the business wasn't sustainable. The process was incredibly complicated, and for each car, you might make as little as a $10,000 profit. That's not worth it to me. Yeah. Although people were psyched to buy a Skyline, their biggest fans were younger enthusiasts who didn't have a massive amount of disposable income. At a minimum, ca cars cost thirty dollars to $40,000, and keep in mind that's early 2000s money, and some of the cars could cost a lot more. People were annoyed because they would look up and see that the car was half the price in Japan. They didn't understand how involved the import process was and wanted a similar deal. Although MotorX was a hot name in the business with glowing write-ups in Road and Track and Motor Trend Magazine, eyeballs didn't necessarily translate to dollars. Unless you're selling eyeballs to witches. <laughs> Which is a great Meanwhile, business model and we should uh, talk about it offline after this. Meanwhile, the company couldn't control its own destiny. For stuff like emissions testing, it had to contract out the work to third-party companies, meaning a car had to be shipped out and might not come back for four to six months, just for one step to be completed in a long, complicated process. If you're going to break even in this business, you had to be doing huge numbers of sales, and that's where MotorX really felt short. Over the entire lifespan of the company, from 1999 to 2006, the firm would only sell about 120 cars. For perspective, in Sean's current importing business, he has to sell that many cars in a single year to keep afloat. On the other hand, the company's external image couldn't be any more shiny and glamorous. A lot of this coincided with the Skyline and other JDM cars exploding in popularity. MotorX both fed into and benefited from this trend. The biggest example is probably a little uh, indie movie called The Fast and the <laughs> Furious, which debuted in 2002. Sean actually supplied his personal yellow Skyline GTR uh, driven in the movie by Leon, played by Johnny Strong. The only character to not come back, I think. Yeah. Uh, he's got the yellow R33. Yep. What is it? Roads closed, pizza man. Yeah, he's got the best line in the movie, and, yeah. he, and they didn't bring him back. The car was nicknamed Big Bird. 
It was actually Motor X's demo car and had raced at events around the country, including Pikes Peak. In Too Fast, Too Furious, Paul Walker's character, Brian, would be the one to get behind the wheel of a Skyline. Craig Lieberman bought the initial car in 2001 for Motor X for 78 grand before Universal had even fully committed to the sequel. By the time the movie was greenlit, Lieberman bought four additional GTRs directly for Motor X to double for the original. And the cars were actually flown over on a 747 from Japan to be here in time for the shoot. Wow. It's like, it's weird that they would le- like pay all the money to legalize them. For, to just send them back. For the movie. Yeah. Maybe it was cost effective just to buy them once, have them legalized, and then keep them instead of having to like buy it and then ship it back and have yeah. to deal with getting rid of them after the movie. I was just going to say, Craig Lieberman has his own uh, YouTube channel. He was the uh, one of the main guys in charge of all the cars for the Fast and Furious series, and uh, he puts out a lot of videos behind the scenes yeah, I think he, of all those cars. He just Very hit, interesting. He just hit a big subscriber milestone or something. Hey, guys. Back again. I just want to remind you about Bring Back Bronco, the new podcast about the rise and fall and rebirth of the Bronco. Like I've said before, I've listened to the show. It's really good. I think you're going to like it, too. In fact, I know you're going to like it, too. The host, Sonari Glinton, he's really great. He paints a really detailed picture of what was going on inside Ford at the birth of the car um, during the O.J. Simpson chase. Uh, Yeah, that happened. Duh. Probably the most famous Bronco of all time. Can't talk about the Bronco without mentioning that, unfortunately. Also, Lee Iacocca is involved in the in the uh, series. Well, he wasn't just a Mustang guy. He also helped the Bronco come to life as well. And then the show also goes inside Ford's mysterious Studio S, which is the, the Skunk Works lab that gave birth to the Thunderbird, and the Mustang, and the original Bronco. I think you're really going to enjoy this podcast. So after you're done listening to our show, go check out Bring Back Bronco, The Untold Story. Search for Bring Back Bronco, The Untold Story, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, Like I said, I'll include a link in the show notes and the description. My thanks to Bring Back Bronco for their support. Thank you guys very much. Hollywood was definitely rubbing off on Motor X. Pretty much everyone who worked at Motor X was young, with most in their 20s, with disposable income, living in Los Angeles, a city that definitely knows how to party. Take it from the three of us. (laughs) <laughs> Hero in particular was a fan of Japanese hostess clubs, a popular form of entertainment for men in Japan. Hostess clubs are basically nightclubs where, in addition to bottle service, you get the company of a young lady to party with you or a young gentleman. Sean would go along for the ride, and while he wasn't playing, he remembers Hero getting bills as high as five or $8,000 for a night at the club. Motor- oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> What's the most you guys have ever spent at, at the club? Like 80 bucks. I don't know. Yeah, like 65 <laughs> bucks probably. <laughs> I also don't go to clubs. Like I would, when we were, I would, I like bars, like <laughs> bars. Yeah, me too. I, I finally got, I finally like got my credit card under control and mm-hmm. paid off a lot of debt. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is some, there is some charges incurred on there from several years ago that I was probably still paying the interest on just cause I was like, dude, fuck, <laughs> I got the credit card. Yeah. That's before I knew about credit card debt. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm an idiot. Don't mm-hmm. take financial advice from me. Motor X suffered. Hero would go missing for days at a time, not showing up to work. Calls to his phone would go straight to voicemail. Meanwhile, he was promising cars to customers that weren't even in the States yet. Someone would fly down to Motor X from Seattle to pick up their Skyline, and the car wouldn't be there when they arrived. Meanwhile, Hero would be absent and unreachable. This kept happening, and although Sean loved the cars... Didn't want to, this is a quote, deal with the shit. And how do you, like, how do you feel about your relationship with him now? Because, I mean, it seemed like he was taking advantage of you and a lot of people's, like, goodwill towards this, like, exciting car culture, but... Uh, yeah, so in 2002, I was pretty pissed off at him. Mm-hmm. Right before when they got closed, I met up with Hero. Mm-hmm. In L.A. Mm-hmm. Starbucks on Flower Street in LA. I, I said to him, you know, look, you've got all this shit that's sideways. What can we do to fix this? And so, and I started to talk to GK, and they're a big registered importer. They were the lab that was doing all of Hero's emissions, EPA work and ARB work. You know, basically, um, I was going to work with them to take over. 
uh, Motorex is doing as far as the compliance work. And uh, about a week later, Hero got arrested. He, you know, he, uh, he got arrested. So. Wow. And uh, everything was total from there. After Sean left, he immediately started to hear signs of trouble at Motorex. One of his buddies asked Hero to sell some cars on his behalf. Hero sold the cars, but he didn't send Sean's friend the money. Meanwhile, Hero was bypassing the approval process for cars and giving customers their vehicles before the NHTSA had signed off on them. The Dream Factory was turning into a nightmare. Meanwhile, the cops were getting involved. A detective at the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department named Raymond Sima was investigating Erna. Hero. Cerna. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it looks the like worst an M. Fake name. <laughs> it looks like an M on my I know, dog. yeah, yeah. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I've ne like I've never noticed that, but yeah, an R and an N next to each other does look like a <laughs> M. <laughs> it looks like an M. <laughs> okay. A detective at the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department named Raymond Cerna was investigating Hero for five skylines, which had been reported stolen and later recovered. I feel like I feel like like he's probably not at all, but I feel like Raymond Cerna is like the real uh, Brian. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like he's like young, and he's like undercover in the scene. He's just like, hey, uh, looking to get some skylines. Uh, <laughs> in 2006, a guy named Tom Fukamoto was leaving a Japanese hostess bar known as Tea Up around two in the morning. Security cameras recorded as two men jumped Fukamoto, beating him and zapping him with a stun gun. He had burns all over his body from the electricity. Witnesses said that the attackers were Hiro and one of his associates. It's impossible to know what the relationship was between Hiro and the guy he beat up, but safe to say Motorex was now involved in some incredibly shady business. Hiro went missing, and that's when detectives put out a warrant for his arrest. They traced him to his girlfriend's house in Reno. He was arrested and put on a million dollars bail. Meanwhile, they found empty packaging for a, quote, muscle man 600,000 <laughs> volt stun gun stashed in his associate's girlfriend's apartment. Dude. Never leave the evidence at your girlfriend's apartment. Nothing is shadier than a dude who's got a girlfriend in Reno. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I gotta go hide out of my girlfriend's house in Reno for a couple days. And everyone knows Muscle Man stun guns are like the worst quality stun guns. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, they might be a proud sponsor. We don't want to say anything about them <laughs> too poorly, okay? Yeah, don't 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 say anything that's uh is gonna keep us from doing some business with a stun gun company. <laughs> <laughs> it's like at the top of my list for dream sponsorships. <laughs> After Hero was taken in, Detective Cerna turned his attention to what was happening at Motorex. Him and another detective visited the garage and discovered that it had been broken into and totally trashed. Nearly all the cars listed in the inventory were missing. By posting in internet forums and following leads, the detectives put together what had happened. When word got out to the car community that Hero had been arrested, it seemed to have sparked an open season on the skylines that were still at the Motorex lot. An auto theft ring based in Ventura uh, sent guys to loot the skylines, driving them off while nobody was looking. This is sick. Predictably, predictably, the detectives traced much of the theft back to Tom Fukamoto, the guy Hero had beaten and tased outside the hostess bar. Whoa. Eventually, the detectives couldn't pin anything on Hero. The charges were dropped, and he basically disappeared. Mostly out of curiosity, Sean has asked contacts in both the United States and Japan if they have any leads on Hero's whereabouts, but in almost 15 years, nobody has heard from the guy. Whoa. Wow. This should be I, a movie, dude. This dude's this the hide-and-seek champion. <laughs> yeah, dude, he would <laughs> totally win on Mr. Beast. <laughs> That's how he could get all his money back. He joins Mr. Beast's crew. He s keeps winning all... Uh, ultimate hide and seek, extreme hide and seek challenges, pays everybody back. Look, hero, if you're listening to us right now, hit us up. We'll get in contact with Mr. Beats and we'll bring you, you guys together, and you guys can hide and seek together. Now, unfortunately, wow. it was the car enthusiast who Motorex had initially set out to help who would suffer the most. 
Thankfully, the NHTSA essentially grandfathered in the dozens of skylines that MotorX had brought into the United States, but brought into compliance. They ruled that since the customers had acted in good faith in importing them through MotorX, they would be allowed to keep their vehicles, which is like a nice thing. The rare nice thing that the government did. Yeah. <laughs> However, the pipeline for future Skyline GTRs to get to the States was now completely busted. If you wanted to buy one, you were essentially back at square one. You could either take the legal risk of importing illegally, or you could wait for the car you wanted to be 25 years old. Once a model is over 25, the government allows it to be imported without having to pass the guidelines. If that seems totally arbitrary to you, that's because it is. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm glad we can when they're 25, but like, why not? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can import like older cars with worse emissions that are less safe, but you can't do a new one. Uh, yeah, that's so stupid. Seems to me like it might be about money. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, check out uh, my episode of The D-List on cool cars that we never got in America. We explain why we don't get cool cars in America. However, in 2020, it also means that uh, every year, a new year of Skyline GTR becomes available to sell in the United States, with the 1994 and 1995 models now becoming legal to sell. I'm talking R33s. Hell you can get an R33 here, baby. And if you want to import an R33, which you can legally now, uh, hit up Sean at importavehicle.com. Top rank importers, they're the best. Perhaps fairly, MotorX is now a hated name among Skyline fans who see the company as having sabotaged access to the Skyline GTRs for an entire generation. That may be fair, but it's worth noting that the company started with a lofty goal to navigate an ocean of red tape and bring the GTR to the U.S. market. Um, you know, the truth is, you know, a lot of the times um, they try to do it right, but, you know, Hero f***ed it up, and uh, in the end, any f*** if they release it all, and uh, and then that was it. People say, oh, Motorrad f***ed it all up, they made it so you can't pop. And I'm like, BCP32 is still active. Right. You can still import a 1997 or 1998 R33 GTR. Or, uh, or even GTSD into the U.S. under VCP32 right now. So how bad did Motorrad get up if you could still do it? Right. Well, I mean, it's just kind of uh, where things are right now. So. At the end of the day, maybe it's best to interpret the story of Motorax as a cautionary tale. Dream big, but don't lose sight of reality. Face your failures with bravery. As much as you celebrate your successes, with Hostess Bar Champagne. <laughs> and most importantly, don't stun people with a Muscle Man 600,000 volt stun gun. Because that's very rude. <laughs> what a story, dudes. What a that crazy, is a great story, man. crazy tale. Like, I love it. I'm so glad that we could do this. Um, would you guys ever <laughs> buy like an R33? Yeah. I have a dream... Um, and I've talked to Sean about this and he's like, he's like, oh yeah, I've already, th I, I want to do that too. Um, I want to bring an R33 or an R32 over and make it left hand drive just to piss everybody off. <laughs> or just put it the like center drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> make it very inconvenient. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, uh left-hand drive. Mm -hmm. I actually do really want to, uh, I, I would like an R32 someday. Our, our buddy, Sean Lee, different Sean, let me drive his. And it was, it was fun. It was, it's a cool car. I think it'd be really awesome to have like a, like a tracked out R32. 100. I think that'd be really, that'd be great. Like it'd be so yeah, cool. Yeah. I drove, uh, one of Sean, one of the top rank, uh, R32s around one day and it was awesome. Yeah. Not as fast as you'd think it would be. Um, no, they're not. They're not quick. I mean, by like today's I mean, standards, they're they're zippy. They're zippy. But like the the novelty of being on the right hand side and just the fact that you're driving something that you've seen in so many video games and, you know, YouTube videos that more than makes up for it, you know, and you you, you have street cred. It's a it's a very yeah. cred car. Uh, it was super awesome to drive it around Sawtell, you know. Mm -hmm. there, oh, nice. There's a there's a Super Street article from way back in the day that I read in like high school, and uh, the dude like he's driving 
was driving a Skyline through Vegas. It, I mean, it might have been a Motor X car. Um, but he's like, just like how cool it is, how cool he feels. And just like to have this legend on American streets is like so cool. And he just like, can't believe it. You know, it's just like this kind of like love letter, um, to like the car and how awesome it is. And then at the end of the article, he's like, and then, you know, like I pull up to a red light and the girl in the car next to me rolls down her window and says, Nice Maxima. <laughs> <laughs> so is it, here's a question. Um, is it weird shifting with your left hand? Did you ever feel like at some point you're going to miss a shift or something? The weirdest thing to me is the blinker versus the windshield wiper. Oh, yeah, yeah. You do it it's with actually, your right hand. Yeah. It's surprisingly easy to shift. Like, yeah. I didn't even really think about it. You're like, for like a minute, you're like, oh, this is kind of weird. But then you're just used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to this episode of Pass Gas. I am very stoked that we were able to talk to Sean and get this insider information. It was as much a Pass Gas on Motor X as it was the upbringing of Sean Morris. So, uh, <laughs> glad we could do that. Um, if for some reason you haven't subscribed to our podcast or podcast channel, Donut Podcast on YouTube, please consider doing so. It really helps us out. Um, and follow my co-hosts on social media, James Pumphrey. More power, at baby. Hurspers. <laughs> at James Pumphrey and Joe Weber. Fart up. At Joe Weber. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. It's Joe G. Joe Weber. G. Weber. Joe G. Weber. Be kind. I love you. Wink, wink. <laughs> All right.